Hey, so my family, here we are, session number seven of our journey group study through the book of Galatians. Now we believe that God has something unique to say to each of us, and through these journey groups, we are going to be encouraged, strengthened, and we'll develop authentic community. And I pray that this group is a place where your real life encounters authentic faith. Well, here we are, chapter six and we've been really wrestling through the last five chapters which has really unpacked a lot of paul's uh, letter and paul's challenge to the church in galatia well in chapter five which by the way is a big chapter and takes a lot more than just one week to wrestle through. So I challenge you to go back and study through it because Paul begins to sketch out what life should look like if people are lining up with the Spirit. That it's not about selfish ambition, it's not about pleasing the flesh, but it's actually about experiencing freedom found in Christ. So what he does as he ends chapter 5 and leads into chapter 6 is then he takes what he's talked about of this idea of what it looks like to be lined up with the Spirit, living out the fruit of the Spirit, and applies it to the church inner life, the church's inner life. Because what he understands is that every Christian has an inner struggle between the old nature and the new nature. That we're put in this spot where we're, where we're at war with each other. Inner nature, our old nature versus our new nature. And even though we keep on crucifying our old self, as Paul says, it's a long fight. And it's a continual daily battle. And so what Paul does here is he takes us into this last chapter of the early New Testament letter that contains some, several injunctions, some thoughts, some content, and also a personal greeting directly from him as he pens his own portion of this letter. He says these words. He says, Church, you are to be encouraged not to deal harshly with those who are learning to walk in this new life. That there's going to be some struggle. There's going to be some challenge. But don't be like so aggressive and angry with them. In fact, your task is this, to care for one another. That you actually have to care for one another, not, not uh, harshly uh, force yourself upon them and get in their face and right up in their grill, but to care for one another. Paul teaches the Galatians how to care for one another. He instructs us what it looks like to care for each other. He says, you know what, if someone falls into sin, those of you who are mature in the life of the Spirit, you should gently restore them. You should gently care and restore them because your responsibility is to love others and to care for them. It is a careful process. It's something that has to be done intentional, but not out of curiosity, not out of pride, not to develop this uh, gossip train that you could share with the whole world, but because you care, because you love, and so your conversation is gentle and honest and true. Paul describes Christian care as carrying one another's burdens. That when you see someone who stumbles or falls into sin, that you come alongside of them and you care for them and you begin to carry their burden to help them up and out. You don't just blast them and walk away. We each have a load to bear made up of many things, you know, temptation to failures, to problems, to sorrows. But Paul's encouraging the church to help one another. This is one way we can obey Jesus' command to love one another, is to care for each other, is to carry each other's burdens, to be there for one another, to support one another, to care for each other. Paul then transitions to uh, 
this idea of what will grow depends on what we sow. So he's transitioned out of this care into this more context of, you know what, depending on what you sow into will dictate what you grow. Listen to what he says in verses uh, 7 and 8 of Galatians chapter 6. Don't miss, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Those who live to only satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequence of death and decay. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. That what you sow is what will grow. What actually is going to grow is what you sow into. I mean, if you ever plant, which is now's the time to start planting your gardens, you will never grow something that you don't put in the ground. It's impossible. But if you sow a seed, water it, care for it, make sure it gets the light, then it will begin to grow because you've sown into it. And so Paul, he talks about this new life. And he talks about that tension between the old life and the new life. He says, if we sow to satisfy that old nature, you know, that selfishness, then we'll become corrupt and we'll be destroyed. Yet, if we sow to please the Spirit, our new nature will grow in holiness and we'll reap eternal life. And what Paul says in all of this, he says, church, it's your decision. I can't make it for you. No one else can make that decision for you. Where are you going to sow? Are you going to sow into satisfying your old life, your old nature? Or are you going to sow into this new life, the Spirit, pursuing holiness, becoming more like Jesus? So Paul's challenging us. And as he's challenging us about caring for one another, he's challenging us about this context of choosing to invest in this new life to grow and to continue to grow. He pens a personal note and he talks about from the cross to new creation in verses 7, 11 sorry, through 18. And Paul now is nearing the end of his letter. And he takes the pen from his secretary and he decides to write the last paragraph himself in large letters. Basically what Paul does is he takes the pen from the scribe because the scribe's been transcribing his words. He's been communicating it. He's been writing it out to be able to share this letter. And so what he does is he takes the pen and he begins to write it himself and he uses large capital letters. Maybe to help you understand, it's like that text message you get. And it's all capital letters. And you're like, is he yelling at me? Oh, or is he emphasizing a point? Well, ultimately, Paul's emphasizing a point. He wishes to make himself clear, crystal clear, very clear at the end of this letter as he writes to them using his own penmanship. Saying the people who want you, Galatians, to be circumcised, well, what's happening is they're actually concerned for this outward appearance. Not what's happening inside. It's what happens on the outside. They want to show that Christian converts are coming under the old Jewish law. Because they can't comprehend it any other way. Because they don't necessarily see the transformation. But they want to see it. So they're forcing you to do this outward exercise. But Paul says that by cutting the flesh, they're actually avoiding the cross of Christ. By cutting the flesh, they're trying to replace or take over the transformation that's happened because of the cross and what Jesus has done and the freedom found in him. And as Paul's writing in his own penmanship, the cross is central to salvation. 
The cross is central. It's to preach Christ crucified, that he travels, that he preaches, and that he suffers. And he doesn't back down, and he doesn't change. And he wants the church to know that it's the cross that is central to salvation. Jesus is death and ultimate resurrection. Christ crucified. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and lives in me. Yet the Jewish teachers want to avoid a crucified Messiah at all costs. They want to go back to the safe routine of circumcision and law keeping. And Paul wants them to hear, no, it's about the sacrifice that Jesus made. Paul boasts about the cross, not about himself, but about the cross, because it is the cross that shows him his sin. It's the cross that assures him of his salvation. His sin is canceled. His salvation is certain because of the cross, because of the work of Jesus. The world and its wickedness have no more attraction for him. And he pursues the cross and holiness to become more like Jesus. And Paul's last sign off which became a customary farewell in all of his letters is signing off to the church with the grace of jesus christ and he actually closes the letter instead of calling them idiots as he did at the start because of their foolishness he calls them brothers and sisters Verse 18 ends, My dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Powerful and profound. I'm going to turn it back over to your journey group leaders, and they're going to take you through a series of questions. As you wrestle through this chapter, I pray that God would continue to speak into your life, challenge you, and that your real life would encounter authentic faith as you develop and build genuine, real 